Interested in learning all about Web VR, React VR, A-Frame, 3JS, and the many other web technologies for creating VR experiences? Then this episode is for you, so let's get to it. You are listening to the How to Create VR podcast, weekly conversations with VR professional creators, designers, and producers. Hello and welcome to another episode of the How to Create VR podcast, where I speak with professional creators, designers, developers, and producers who work on VR, AR, and MR projects. I'm your host, Marcelo Lewin, founder of HowToCreateVR.com, your go-to source for VR education. My guest today is John Gwinner, a longtime VR developer who's helped create VRML and Web3D. John has presented numerous times at the Game Developer Conference on various topics, including 3D toolkits, AR, and VR. He also wrote the book on React VR titled Getting Started with React VR, which is available now on Amazon. He's currently developing VR interfaces to data as well as a couple of VR games. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. I'm glad to have you here. I think we met through Twitter. Was it through Twitter or LinkedIn? I don't know. Sometimes it's hard to keep up. It was probably LinkedIn. Honestly, I don't do Twitter much. I I understand the value of it, but I just uh, sometimes I need my quiet time to create things. I hear you. I hear you. So yeah, we met through LinkedIn. You wrote a book on React VR, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. But before we do that, I already talked a little bit about your background, but maybe you can expand a bit more. Sure. So I've been doing VR for quite a long time because the way that I started with it is I had a contract to build a VR front end for CompuServe. Well, they're, they're gone now, actually, but they used to be, if you were online, the place to be was CompuServe. They were the only international, you know, online presence. And then as the web kind of started up, I, I think they just didn't really quite understand the transition to the web. And then VR crashed. I mean, it, it peaked for a while. People were doing things, and then it kind of crashed. And then it was basically quiet for a while. And now, of course, it's, it's starting up again. This time, I think it's going to stay, but we, we can talk about that a bit more in the future. But that's kind of how I initially got involved in VR. Specifically, how I got involved in React VR is I was answering a lot of questions on Quora about virtual reality and augmented reality. The publisher liked the way that I wrote enough that they contacted me and asked me to write the book. So it's almost like a reverse agent. <laughs> Oh, that's pretty crazy. So, hey, that's that's an encouragement to be on Quora and become an expert like you did, right? Because you never know. Yeah, exactly. I was probably wasting a little bit too much time on it. And some friends of mine were, you know, why are you doing that? It's not, you know, you you need to be out looking for more contracts. But bam, then I got the book. So it can work out. But you know, VR is obviously something that I'm pretty passionate about. So it's and it's it's interesting how many people just have the absolute wrong impression of what VR is or what it needs to be. But they're not they're not, you know, bad questions. They're good questions that people don't know. And so, you know, I, I just sort of felt this responsibility to, you know, kind of answer the basics in a way that encouraged them to experiment further. I think we need a lot more people like you too to do that. I try to do similar things. I, I, I consider myself an evangelist of VR and we should be out there educating people and trying to expand the market of people using VR. So what was your first VR experience as a user? Ooh, it depends if we're talking recently or if we're talking ancient history. <laughs> so if you don't mind, I'd like to tell both stories because they're kind of illuminating. So I would say my first VR experience was probably well, I guess you could really say that it was the original Doom because that was what at the time we considered VR. It was a persistent 3D world. You could, you know, it wasn't with head mounted displays or goggles, you know, it was just on a screen. And at the time that I, I was working on the Composer project on VRML, I remember predicting, unfortunately, I can't find an email, but I remember predicting that if we didn't get things right, there would be a persistent online world rendered in full 3D where people would meet other people from all over the world and kill them. And I was absolutely correct because World of Warcraft has millions of people in it every day. But today we don't call that VR. Today we call it VR if you have, you know, the goggles and and essentially that's it, either f- what I'd like to call RR, recorded reality, in other words, 360 video or true, you know, virtual reality where it's all pre-generated. But the second experience I had with VR is I was at, at the Experts Dojo over in Santa Monica, and they had a VR meetup. And I, I put on the Vive headset, and I've worked these issues. I've spoken, it was a while ago, but I've spoken on, on you know, VR rendering. 
and location and, and things like that. And I remember putting on the headset and seeing the image of the controllers in front of me and expecting to have to fumble, fumble around for them because what you see in the screen is not going to be quite what you see in real life. And I reached out and the controllers were literally right there. I mean, it, it was such a powerful presence of reality and it was just kind of blew my mind that the tracking was that perfect. And I said, oh, I have to have one of these. So I, I pulled money out of, out of my IRA, actually, to purchase the Vive. <laughs> yeah, I love seeing the reaction of people when I put them in VR for the first time. And you literally get that wow kind of reaction, like you just said. And it's just the greatest feeling ever. I just did a, a recent meetup where I did an introduction to VR for people that you know are filmmakers but never done VR at all. And I put them on the Rift, and every single one of them literally shout it wow after they got in there and started experiencing it so it's pretty cool now then you decided to get into creating vr so what was your what was the first vr experience you created mostly i've been working with unity i actually sort of intellectually prefer unreal although i started doing unity because one of the things that i was doing is actually a, a vr experience from a book that i'm writing and i wanted to put it on the web and Unity had a way that you could do a web, uh, an HTML5 app that did not require a plugin. And so I sort of took a detour from Unreal to work on this Unity app while I was also working on, uh, uh, well, this was before the book. And I was actually working through a couple of uh, Udemy classes. Unity is, you know, I'm a, a C++ developer from way back. And I'm used to just a flat IDE interface, looking at the code, visualizing the code in my head. And when you look at something like Unity or Unreal, it can be a little overwhelming at first because there's all these knobs and buttons and dials and dialogues and property sheets and things like that. And it can be a little confusing because if you read the tutorials, they'll tell you, well, go to the timeline and add a keyframe. And you're like, well, where's the timeline? <laughs> so I, I just finally decided it's kind of embarrassing because I've never taken a class in computers. I'm usually at the forefront and figure it out before there are classes. But I actually just went to Udemy and, and bought a class. And, you know, it was one of the best things I did because working through the, the steps in the class, it's, you know, it, it was kind of, a, it was, you know, it just helped. It was like when you watch the guy move the cursor and click on something, then you sort of get it. And YouTube videos usually just make me squirm because I want to skim ahead. You know, I want to, and on a page, you know, a written page, you can do that. But there's a big difference between, you know, watching it and then trying to read, you know, what the menu navigation is. Once you're snapped into that, then you can skim tutorials. But you know, having some kind of a YouTube video, or in this case, Udemy course, just sort of helps to, to ground you. And this stuff is a lot easier than doing it the hard way. I mean, I've used retained mode APIs. I've used an old system called Ren386 that did the raw rendering. And so I know what's involved in all that, and it's quite involved. Nobody nowadays really needs to write their own engine. So working at the higher level is just so much more freeing because you can concentrate on the app and less on, you know, should that pixel be one dot over to the left or you know, what am I going to do if the, if the HMD, you know, lenses are, are uh, you know, slightly warp the image? Somebody else is taking care of all that. And that somebody else probably has a PhD in optics, you know? <laughs> right, 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 right. Exactly. So you have the engines taking care of the pipeline and you focus on the content, basically. What was your first experience you created? Do you, do you remember? It was probably just a, it was a little like a laser shooter, like almost a, a Space Invaders type clone. But the first VR experience I did was, the, uh, in the course, there was he had you working on a bowling game, but the bowling game was mostly he was showing you how to do set up uh, simulation controllers. But I started having fun with it. What I did is I, I got some images of garden gnomes, and I, I made it a garden gnome bowling game. And so I've actually worked it up to a, it's not out yet, and it probably won't be out for, I don't know, six months because I have some other projects. But I started doing a lot more modeling because instead of pins, their garden gnomes. And then I invented this whole backstory that you're on this colony planet and the garden gnomes are being manufactured and you're actually a friendly house robot. So you're a, you're basically a GI Joe type robot, which solves the problem of looking down and not seeing your hands. So <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Which is often an issue in VR. You know, it, it's, if you see your elbow, hands are one thing, but if you look down and see an elbow, that's just, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a mind blowing type thing. But, you know, and that's that's kind of what I started doing specifically in VR. But I'd say most of the stuff that I've done actually has been content for the book, which has its own constraints. As of today, I'm sure you've tried tons of different VR experiences. Which one stands out for you and why? 
I'm often asked this, and I have to say the initial experience that really blew me away was was honestly the steam calibration, you know, doing the room calibration. Just looking down and seeing the controllers in front of me is, it, you know, kind of blew my mind. Let's see, experiences. That's a good question because I dabble in a lot of them. Tilt brush usually is the one that everybody points to, but when I bought the Vive, it was about a month after they were running the free tilt brush thing. So I haven't actually messed with that until just recently. I bought it a couple of months ago when it was on sale. Tilt brush is nice. You know, the, the problem with a lot of VR experiences is most of them are computer games because the people come from that experience. You know, they come from the gaming world that write VR apps. So most of them are actually, you know, games. And the nice thing about tilt brush is it's more, it's making you the content creator, which is, you know, tremendously empowering. It's one thing to put on a headset and grab controllers and interact with something, you know, that you perceive as real, but then it's another level to actually create things which you then perceive as real. So that's what I find so fascinating with tilt brush. The environment or the thing that I'm doing the most right now is I, I bought Fallout VR just to see what a quote triple A game was like in VR. And it's amazing, but the, the interf interface isn't completely as VR as, as I would like. It's still very tied to a trackpad type interface. Like when you when you bring up your little wrist mounted computer, there's all these neat looking knobs and stuff on it, but you can't just reach out and grab a knob and fiddle with it. You you have to slide your fingers around on the trackpad. So it, it kind of pulls you out of the experience a little bit. But, you know, it's just amazing to walk around and stare at screens and, and you know, signs in real life and, and, and stuff like that. So a lot of what I enjoy doing is just going in there and building things and exploring the world. Yeah, I heard really good things about Fallout VR lately. I guess they just released it. So, or was that Skyrim? Well, Skyrim is on, I think, I'd have to double check this, but I think Skyrim is only on PlayStation. Oh, no, no, no. They released it for the Rift now. They have it for the Oh, that, they did? Yeah, yeah they oh, did. That's great. Yeah, so maybe that's the one they just released. But I just purchased Island 359. You know, they're having a web VR or a, a VR sale on Steam and just bought a bunch of stuff. One of them was Island 359, which is you're in this island with uh, dinosaurs. And it's really cool seeing dinosaurs in VR. Very oh, cool. That's cool. Because that would give you a sense of perspective of the scale and the and the majesty of them, where looking at a photograph, even if there's a photograph of a human in it, just doesn't do. No, right. Exactly. Or even if you're playing a game on a flat screen kind of thing, it's not the same as you're looking up and there's the dinosaur. So it's definitely good. We could talk about four hours on all these experiences, but let's move on to what people really want to hear, which is all, you know, how to create VR experiences using a variety of web VR technology. So why don't we start out with basically defining web VR? What is it? What does it entail? Well, you know, web VR is kind of interesting because I've been doing computing for a long time. The, the real key with web VR is just JavaScript, which initially started as kind of a, well, it started as Java, not JavaScript. It was just a way to have some kind of intelligence in web pages, you know, more than just the text in, a, in effect. But it's really gone full scale to it's it's a complete application. You know, you can write complete applications in it. I mean, if you use the online version like Google Docs or if you use the online versions of Microsoft Word, for example, or Excel, that's Word, full functional Word in JavaScript. So and that's what really enables web VR. It's uh, there's a library called 3.js, which uses GPU rendering, graphics processing unit rendering on mobile or on the desktop. And that's really has been the key to being able to do real-time graphics in a browser. But, you know, as a, as a C++ developer and somebody that's worked pretty bare metal with rendering, uh, again, ages ago, and not GPU related, I sort of had this, this slight jaundice attitude toward JavaScript. It's like, well, it's interpreted. How good can it be? It can be pretty good. I mean, it's with just-in-time compiling and some of the other speed-ups behind the scenes, you know, JavaScript is, is perfectly capable of rendering, you know, millions of polygons. And so as a result, you know, what's happened is the browser manufacturers have added APIs into JavaScript that allows you to access the, the really high-speed rendering hardware. And that was really the key. And then there's also APIs deep down in there to access some of the controllers, you know, the Gear VR controller which is only three degrees of freedom. In other words, you can only point it. You can't move it. Or the, the Rift and the Vive six-degree freedom controllers, which, you know, you can move around, you know, and gives you a, a powerful sense of presence. So you can access those programmatically, which means that you can then interact with a virtual reality world. So you can render it quickly. You can interact with it. 
there's no difference between that and something like Unity or, or well, there are differences, but you know, the point is you can do a real VR experience. And so while I was writing the book, initially I was thinking, well, this is kind of a toy or it's kind of cute, you know, and then the more I got into it, I realized this is incredibly empowering and it's, it's very capable. I'm sort of getting ahead of myself, but you know, the key really was that the browsers have to, the browser manufacturers have to add support. And that also makes it a little spotty because you've got to find a browser. It used to be, for example, Firefox Nightly, which is a nightly development build, is the only one that ran VR. But they've rolled support into it into Firefox itself. So a lot of the stuff is moving so quickly, it's a moving target. And you've got to keep up on patches. You've got to keep the latest browsers. You know, you've got to you know, really, you know, kind of stay up on things. And unfortunately, it gives a slightly rough user experience because you might try one browser and maybe it doesn't work so well. You try a different browser and suddenly you're just thinking, oh my God, this is unbelievable. Right, right. And I think Chrome just announced full support for WebVR as well in version 66. So that was my dilemma was, what do I put in the book and what do I tell people to use? Because it could be vastly different when the book comes out. I was really impressed by how quickly the book actually came out. I finished the final drafts and then about three weeks later it was in Amazon. So that was, that was actually pretty impressive. But you know, the, you know, what do you tell people to use when support kind of bounces around? But yeah, Firefox and Chrome both work pretty well. I've heard Microsoft Edge works well, but I'm embarrassed to admit that my main development machine is actually still running Windows 7. So I don't use Edge on that as much. IE support was a little spotty. Yeah, I would not worry about IE anyway, but I would stick with Firefox, yeah. now Chrome, and probably Third Edge. So let's talk about WebVR for a minute. So WebVR really is, is like an umbrella for all these technologies that you were kind of throwing out there, right? We have React VR. We have, you mentioned 3JS. There's also A-Frame. Can you explain really what is 3JS in comparison to A-Frame in comparison to React VR? So, so we can understand all these pieces, how they come together. It's a good question because you have to dive a little bit into it. At a superficial level, you really don't. You can code completely real experiences with just using A-Frame or React. But essentially, you've got, I guess from the bottom up, you've got your hardware, the GPU, the various controllers. Then essentially, you have the browser, which talks to that directly You know, inside the, the browser code itself. The browser then presents these programming interfaces to JavaScript. 3.js, which is 3D in JavaScript, is a library that sits on top of the browser that enables you to do things like, you can say, there's a polygon from, you know, these three points in space, and here's a pointer to its material, you know, and then set up a transform, a matrix transform, you know, and then apply that matrix transform to the polygon, assemble polygons into an object. So it's a it's a very low level interface, although not as low level as you know put a pixel here, and then between 3JS and the browser, mostly the browser, it will use the GPU to render it at full speed, depending on the capabilities of the of the browser. So if you're using 3.js, you have to worry a little bit about what kind of hardware people have, but not very much. Most of it 3JS it, itself handles. What A-Frame and React VR do is they put another layer on top of 3JS. They both use it, but you don't have to access it directly. And you can just, if you want to create a box, instead of having to say, you know, well, I'll set up four vertices and I'll pass an array of vertices, an array of materials into a, you just say angle bracket box, angle bracket, and bam, now you've got a box in the world. So they, they all increasingly abstract things. The nice thing, and I know more about React VR than A-Frame. But the nice thing with React VR, you can, you can still use 3JS if you want. There's a thing called native views where you can essentially build native code in a different module and then simply use that via the HTML-like language that React VR is. So it gives you a nice way, like if you want to do reflections, for example, you can just go ahead and, and code the mirror using 3.js or using one of its samples and then just include that directly into your world as a as a, an actual object, just, you know, angle bracket, mirror angle bracket, you know, kind of a thing. So just to clarify a little bit more, 3JS is we really in general, we don't have to worry about it's being handled through a frame or React VR, where React VR, we can actually access it directly if we wanted to 3.js. Now, let's talk about between a frame and React VR. 
What's the difference between them? It sounds like the, you could pick one or the other. You wouldn't do both. So what's the difference between them? And why would you pick one over the other? Well, actually, ironically, you can do both. There was a guy on one of the 3D UI mailing lists that was experimenting with using both of them. And there are some slight advantages to that because each library has its own you know, strengths and weaknesses. I have not done a detailed comparison of the two, I have to admit, yet. That I'm doing for my next book. I want to make my next book a little bit more general and then have and essentially take the same game and do it three or four different ways. And then literally at a detailed level, show the, uh, show the differences. But at a high level, I think React VR probably is slightly less popular than A-Frame. Most people seem to know A-Frame more than React VR. And then the other thing is A-Frame is slightly easier, I think, at a, at a, as a beginner to use because it's got an online editor. You can toggle an editor and you can just move objects around in the world and then persist that world. The, the thing with React VR from a usability standpoint is if you're sitting there and you're thinking, well, I have to put a sphere in front of me. So is that Z minus, is that, you know, Y minus four or is that Z minus four? And you'll put the sphere there and you'll think, well, that's awfully far away. Well, maybe it's just really tiny, you know? And so you've got to kind of scratch your head and grab a piece of graph paper and sort of sketch out where everything is. And then in A-frame, you can just kind of grab the objects and move them around with a cursor. So from a usability standpoint, that makes it slightly better. The nice thing, though, with React is that it, it exposes you to the entire React native you know, world of modules and add-ons um, and things. So if you want event passing, for example, you can just load event bus or another, you know, or redo or another React library. Now, a lot of the React libraries are for HTML, and that applies to an extent. I mean, you can put text into a 3D world, but you know, not as much, obviously. So in a nutshell, that's kind of the difference. You know, one of my future things is I, I am going to dive a little bit into the more specific differences. Are they both HTML markups or are, or are they both mainly JavaScript APIs? Yes and no. So A-Frame is, is almost purely HTML off the top of my head. You can include other things, but you, you have to do it through script notes. Whereas React VR, well, not script notes, but Anyway, React VR is, uh, is something called JSX, which looks like HTML, but it's really JavaScript, which sounds a little confusing. So it's run through a compiler that extracts the two. It extra extracts the XML and it extracts the, the JavaScript. So you, the nice thing is you can just kind of fluidly code. Like you can say things like X equals X plus one. And then you can say box location equals X, you know. You know, you, you can do code like that where you can never do that directly in HTML, yet you're doing angle bracket box. You don't have to say, you know, my object equals, quote, angle bracket box, unquote, you know, something like that. So it's sort of a combination of both XML, HTML, and, and JavaScript. Now, that can lead to some interesting things. I wasted almost two days, and the publisher only gave me five days per chapter. I wasted almost two days trying to track down a bug in my maze. Where if, if I made it, if I made it like, like four by four, it was nice. And if I made it five by five, suddenly it became so wide, you couldn't see the end of the maze. And I, I was trying to figure out why that happened. And it, it turned out because in, in HTML, you can say things like, you know, image, you know, um, height equals quote five quote. And so that's what I was doing in, in my maze is I had, you know, demand, you know, X equals quote five quote. And then later on in the code, I, you have to have an edge for your maze. So, you know, you add one for the uh, left edge or, you know, two, one for the left edge, one for the right edge. And so I added two and I was getting 52 because what was happening is I put quote five quote for the size. And so JavaScript said, oh, that's a string. Well, how do you add two to a string? You concatenate it. So five plus two is 52. And it, I tell you, it took me a while to figure that out. And of course, the, the Facebook people were like, well, you know, it's, it's JSX. And, you know, it's kind of embarrassing. What I needed to have said was X equals open brace five, close brace. And if you know JSX, that just comes naturally. But if you don't know JSX, it can be very confusing because you, you type that kind of thing in HTML. So, you know, there's a few places in the book where I say, you know, I say note, you know, and, you know, it's a little call out part of uh, PACT's, the publisher's, you know, way of doing technical books. And I say, note, you know, be careful to you, you know, yes, you can use quotes here, 
but it's better to use open and closed braces. And I say, you know, ask me how I know. Right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know. So from a development perspective, do you think it's safe today to create stuff in web VR using a frame or using React VR? Or are we doing something that maybe in a year because of standards not being fully developed and things changing constantly that we're developing something that may break or, or completely not function at all? in the near future? That's a really good question. And it's the same problem with people that say, you know, well, I don't want to buy VR now because it's going to be better in the future. To answer that, I'm going to take you back a, a bit. When I was in college, I had worked one summer and I had a little bit of cash and I was going to buy a stereo because everybody that was cool had big stereos, right? And I remember asking a stereo salesman, because being a nerd, of course, I was reading all these reviews and technical things. I remember walking in a stereo store and asking the guy, the salesman, what stereo do you have? And he goes, oh, I have next year's model. And I, I had this panic. Like, it's like buying a, uh, a Rift or a Vive today. And you say, well, are you getting the, you know, are you going to do the pro version? You know, are you going to get the base version? You know, and so I had this panic. I was like, oh my God, there's a better thing is going to come out next year. I need to wait. And I said, uh, oh, what are you waiting for? And he goes, oh, next year, I'll wait for next year's model. And he said, I'm never obsolete. I always wait for the next year's model. So I never have to worry that I'm buying something that's going to go obsolete. And, you know, I thought about that. That stereo is sitting upstairs right now. I still have it. It's flaking, you know, some of the chrome is flaking, flaking off in a few places. But I've listened to a lot more music since I've been out of college and when I was in college, and that salesman has listened to. So it's the same thing about VR. Yeah, you could wait and see if maybe React does well or doesn't do well or A-Frame does better. Or a friend of mine, uh, Leonard Daly, has just released something called Xscene, which is HTML-like web VR on the web. So there's a lot of, of, of semi-competing protocols out there. But the point is, just like that stereo salesman, if you start today, you're going to experience a lot of VR in the next six months. And if somebody just sits there and waits, A, they're probably never going to do it. B, somebody else will do it. And they'll say, oh, I had that idea. You know, you don't want to be that guy at the bar saying, I had that idea. You know, I invented Kleenex and I would have been a billionaire. You know, it's just you know, you, you've got to, I don't want to use a, an athletic slogan, but you've got to get, just get out there and do it, you know? And if you, I'm a huge believer of that slogan, just do it. You're right. You know, that, yeah. that's, that's a great uh, recommendation. I completely agree with you. And you know, the, the other thing about this is all of these technologies are open source and they're not going to go away. So if you do something in React VR, maybe in 10 years, you're the only guy that's maintaining the React VR repository at GitHub because you had to fork it from Facebook years ago. But, you know, it's, it's, it, support won't go away. It just may become less active. So, you know, it's, it's, and that's one of the things that makes a lot of this stuff just free to experiment, just jump in and do it. Are there Unity-like utilities or apps that allow you to create web VR. You mentioned a little bit before, you, you mentioned about dragging and dropping. Are there any kinds of apps that allow me to, instead of having to define or code a box, that allow me just to, you know, create a new solid and, and create a, a, a new box and add it here and just move it around just like you do in Unity? A-Frame itself does. There's, I think they have a couple of demo apps where you can uh, like click on it's a flat UI, so you, you don't – I haven't tried it in a headset. Mostly you do it sitting and, you know, staring at the, at the screen. There's like a UI on the side where you can click on things and add objects, and then you can drag them around with the cursors. It's not quite as full-featured as Unity. Honestly, I don't know, but I believe that the answer is yes, but I couldn't tell you which ones they are. I see. Cool. What about AR? I mean, we've been talking about web VR, right? But what, what about AR experiences and using the web for that? That is coming. So those APIs are still very much in flex. And when I say in flex, I mean in the browser itself. So there's a couple of, there's actually an AR browser called argon.js, which you can, you know, you can code AR experiences in it. It uses the device camera and it localizes. You can also do, it's more of a Unity thing, but you can, um, there's other libraries that you can do AR with. But your question specifically is about web AR. So What's happening is that the, the browsers know this is coming, and it's probably a bigger market than VR because everybody has a phone in their pocket nowadays. And, you know, you're just walking down the street. You want to pop it out and just point it around and, you know, see where the mailbox is, you know. Everybody says Starbucks, but I figure if you really need to mail something, you're going to wonder where the mailbox is. 
you know, so it's coming. It's a little rough right now. So some of the APIs are there, but it's very much in the experimentation stage. Yeah, I was actually trying to do an AR app for Yuri's Night, which is a worldwide celebration of the first human in space. Every uh, right around the second week of April, April 12th, I think is the exact date. I was working on a scheduling app that would be an AR thing where you could just point your camera around and see where to go. Because it's the this event is usually at the California Science Center, and it's it's kind of uh, it's kind of a labyrinth. You know, I found out that some of the apps weren't quite. I mean, it's close, it's close, but they weren't quite there yet. So you know, the answer is yes, it's out there, it's happening, but that's that's very experimental. But you know, I think that's going to be the key because the other big advantage of web VR and for that matter, web AR will have obviously the same advantage. You don't have to download something. You don't have to go to the store and find the app and download it, install it, and agree to the permissions. You just open a URL on a web page, and then bam, you're there. And so, you know, that'll be the key. Like maybe you're walking past Starbucks and you you see a QR code and you look at it with your phone. Your phone bleeps, and then it shows you four sizes of cups right in front of you. And then you can say, "Oh, good grief, the grande is really big. I think I'll go for the medium." Oh, it's not called a medium. You know, it, you know, you'll be able to just kind of look at it and know, oh, I think I, I'll take a venti, you know, maybe in line. I'm just sort of making that up. But, you know, the point is, you don't, it, it, you know, that's the whole point of the web is you can get to places, you can get to things, you can get to people, you can get to information just by looking and clicking instead of having to download and install and, and that kind of thing. So it, it you know, it's going to come. Yeah, it has to be made easier. So that's what WebXR is, right? That's the rebranding of WebVR to include AR. Yeah, it, it is. I, you know, I, I just, it's one of the things as an old timer that does make me shake my head is is the, pol- uh, you know, proliferation of just new buzzwords. And does it really matter? Well, actually, some of the buzzwords make a certain amount of sense. Like I've heard people discuss MR, mixed reality, as different from AR, augmented reality. And I've, I've even heard the phrase augmented virtual reality or augmented virtuality. You know, sometimes you don't need to label something as much as just kind of know what it is. So augmented virtual reality just means you're in a VR experience and yet you see like a hologram of an actual person, like from a webcam, you know, that kind of thing. Whereas mixed reality means it's augmented reality, but maybe like if you point the camera at the sidewalk, maybe it looks like there's a hole in the sidewalk, which isn't, whereas augmented reality in theory means it's reality with stuff on top, you know, so that's kind of the way that I've heard the phrase XR, you know, discovered, but you know, like some of the questions I see on Quora are, you know, should I do AR or VR? Well, do all of it. You know, the same techniques that you learn that are good for AR are going to be good for VR. Some are very specific, like markers. How do you scan a marker? So some are really specific. But overall, if you understand 3D spatialization, you know, you understand right hand rules, you understand X, Y, Z, you know, is Y up or is Y in the screen, you know, it, it's some of these fundamentals are fundamentals and everything. And I realize some of what I said is kind of confusing, but when you look at it on the screen, it's really not. And so, you know, it's, it's, I, that's why I kind of celebrate the phrase XR. It's like, yeah, I do. I usually say I do VR, but you know, it's just, it's all kind of the same fun thing, adding more information to the world and allowing us to see information that we perceive is real and that's that's just really key to to you know making the whole experience more human now for developers that have never done vr or ar and they want to get into web vr right now can you tell them what should they start with so give them step one do this step two do this step three learn this well i would say step one buy my book <laughs> um I, and there you I, go uh, yeah, there you go. It it literally does bring you all the way from the beginning, all the way to publishing it on the web. Um, and I actually used my own book yesterday to double check. I was at the LA Times Festival of Books, and I thought it might be an attention getter to sit at the table with my HMD on or be able to show people this is one of the worlds you can build in the book. And so I published one of the examples you know, on the web. And I actually cracked open my own book because, you you know, you don't publish stuff on the web all the time. And so it was kind of handy to just see a nice little checklist for how to do it. But the answer is, aside from buying the book, you know, shameless plug, obviously, go to the documentation sites and try to read their getting started. Some of them are a little rough. Like I found out the hard way when I did the estimate for the book, I figured, oh, well, there's samples on all of these things. So I'll just essentially, you know, I can take the sample 
write about it, make it easy to understand, and bam, I'm done. Oh, no, it's not quite that simple. Some of the samples aren't there. Some of the samples are there, but they'll say things like, well, just assign it to the, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, well, where's the blah, blah, blah? I, I don't get it. So some of the samples are a little bit rough, but a lot of them are right there. A-frame samples are a little bit better documented and available than the React VR. And React VR doesn't have online samples where you can just go and view a sample. I'm going to rectify that soon, but I don't have the website up yet. But, you know, so A-frame is slightly easier. But yeah, you just go to, you know, just, you know, do React VR documentation. Bam, you'll get the GitHub page or A-frame documentation. A good place to start is actually webvr. What is it? Dot info, I think, the web, the web VR homepage. That has a very good intro. It explains what hardware you need or don't need because you don't actually need a headset to experience. You don't experience it as immersive, but you can see it on a web page. So the web VR homepage has some really good info on that. So that's a good place to start. And then you branch off into the, the two different documentation sites. Once you start doing basic hello worlds and start putting some objects in, you'll get a little confused because that's when you start needing to understand things like transforms, 3D space, units like is one is one a foot, an inch, a, a mile, a meter. Usually it's a meter, which is, you know, roughly a yard for us Americans that don't understand a proper numeric system. <laughs> so, yeah, the WebVR homepage, then React or the A-Frame homepages, read the documentation download a text editor, start playing around with the code, and you'll make a lot of mistakes and break things and have to delete it and start over again. And that's just normal. You, you kind of need to play around and break things to understand how to fix it, right? And then transforms a little bit of 3D math, but not too much. You know, you just kind of need to understand if you rotate something and then rotate it, it's different from rotate the other way than rotate the other way. So that'll kind of blow your mind at first. So knowing a little bit of 3D transforms helps. And then get, you know, probably more into JavaScript at some point. So at some point, you might need to pick up a book on, on like JavaScript to learn a little bit more of the of the details. Um, you know, if you're writing like animation code or writing behaviors, you're probably writing that in JavaScript. So you'll need to learn a little bit of JavaScript. That's some good tips right there to get started. So really learn JavaScript and then do either React VR and get your book, of course, or uh, go to A-Frame, but start at webbr.info and, and go from there. So that, that's really good. John, unfortunately, we're pretty much out of time. I like to end this interview with the same question I ask all of my guests, which is describe what you would like VR to be like in the year 2025. Well, I would say more like Ready Player One. Most people think that VR has to look real and it doesn't. VR, by its very nature, seems real even if it doesn't look real. But I do think that graphics rendering is, you know, will get better. Headsets will have higher resolution. So that helps make it a better experience, but it doesn't necessarily makes it more real. So yeah, faster processors, faster cell phones, fa you know, higher bandwidth, all of that's going to help. I think some way of moving around naturally, like the Virtuix Omni would be great. Or if you've seen Ready Player One, the, the, the Neato treadmill that he has, that's not so easy to do in real life because physics. But those kind of things, I think, will help a lot in the future to where you can feel like you're really walking around and then uh, and and more, you know, and just more prevalence. But VR is not going to go away this time because we all have these high power graphics devices in our pockets. So, you know, I expect that things will just continue to get, you know, nobody's buying a slower phone for next year. You know, you always buy a faster phone. So I expect cell phones to get lighter, higher resolution you know, and we'll have more tether, untethered experiences, being able to just walk around without having to have wires and cables drag after you. And better haptics, better controllers, like maybe gloves so you can actually reach out and grab things. The, that kind of thing, I think, will help a lot as well. All those are things I would love to see as well. So, yeah, great list there. Well, John, unfortunately, we're completely out of time. Thank you for being on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. If people want to get a hold of you, do you want to tell them your URL or email or Twitter? Well, you don't do Twitter, but maybe LinkedIn, whatever you like. You can get me on LinkedIn as John Gwinner. I should pop right up. It's actually in slash John Gwinner. My email is john at gwinner.org. Yes, I actually own my own name, but it's .org, not .com. My main website right now is cto4u.com, which is actually a, an online resume. But the book is right at the top, so you can click on that. And then I'm on Quora, usually answering questions about virtual reality. So that's another easy way to 
to find me. Well, excellent, John. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And to the rest of you, I'm glad you were here with me. If you enjoyed this podcast, please remember to subscribe, leave a comment, and like us on iTunes or SoundCloud. For more episodes, check out howtocreatevr.com slash iTunes or howtocreatevr.com slash SoundCloud. If you are ever in the Southern California area, we have a monthly meetup with lots of great presentations. You can join or RSVP for our next meetup at howtocreatevr.com slash meetup. Finally, if you are interested in learning more about how to create VR experiences, please visit howtocreatevr.com. So until the next episode, I'm your host, Marcelo Lewin. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>